When it comes to inventing and drawing a fantastical creature, unfortunately, one's own imagination may sometimes fall short, requiring external assistance and references for inspiration. Undoubtedly, the creative work of Hieronymus Bosch, an unparalleled master and incredibly intriguing artist of the Northern Renaissance, can be indispensable in this regard. He brought to life in his paintings an immense number of the most incredible beings. He was a true creator of nightmares, a person with an extraordinary imagination. So, before starting work on another monstrous creation, this time I chose the Manticore, I turned to Bosch's work as a source of inspiration. Suddenly, I found myself awakened only after a considerable amount of time, Bosch's incredible world simply absorbs, transports to a parallel reality, both frightening and fascinating. No wonder debates have been raging for over 500 years, where did the artist draw his incredible ideas from? What is encrypted in the grotesque painted objects, what secrets do the symbols and phantasmagorical characters of his canvases hold, and was he mentally healthy at all? Let's try to delve into this question together. Moreover, as we study Bosch's work, quite intriguing details come to light, which I will share during the narration. Therefore, the video is divided into two stages, firstly, we will admire one of his most famous masterpieces, exploring it in close detail, and in the second part of the video, we will showcase the actual process of creating the Manticore, whose stylistic inspiration will be drawn from Bosch's works. Throughout the process, I will show which characters and elements influence the painting, and we will also analyze some color and compositional decisions. So, we travel 500 years back and 100 kilometers southeast of Vermeer's Delft, to the hometown of Hieronymus Bosch, S. Hertigen Bosch. Bosch's life, like that of his Delft colleague, is shrouded in mystery. Bosch left behind no diaries, letters, or documents. Additionally, he never dated his works, so we do not know exactly when he painted them and how old he was when he completed them. Hieronymus Bosch is a pseudonym, the artist's real name is Hieronymus Antonissen van Aken. It is believed that he was born around 1450 in the northern part of the Netherlands, in one of the cities of the Duchy of Brabant, S. Hertigen Bosch. Hieronymus belonged to the well-known artistic dynasty of Van Aken's, originating from the German city of Aachen. In 1486, his name is mentioned in the account book of the Brotherhood of the Virgin, whose members adhered to the cult of the Virgin Mary, and with which Bosch was associated throughout his life. The time was quite prolific for great artists. Bosch's contemporaries included Leonardo da Vinci, Albrecht Dürer, and Raphael. There are only about 30 works attributed to Bosch's name, but only nine of them are unequivocally recognized as personally created by him. Moreover, experts confidently attribute about 20 more canvases to Bosch's brush. Many of the artist's works were lost when in 1629 the troops of Prince Frederick Henry of Nassau besieged and almost completely destroyed S. Hertigen Bosch. So, if anyone has a time machine in the attic, please provide an invaluable service to the cultural heritage of humanity, travel back to 1628 and save the priceless legacy of the artist. Within the scope of one video, it is impossible to cover the multifaceted creativity of Bosch, so let's delve a bit deeper into his famous, The Garden of Earthly Delights, and about other equally interesting works, we might discuss separately in future reviews if there is interest from viewers. Undoubtedly, the triptych, The Garden of Earthly Delights, painted in 1503-1504, is the most well-known work of Hieronymus Bosch. Housed in the Prado Museum, the triptych is executed in oil on a panel measuring 220 by 389 centimeters, divided into three parts. The outer panels depict a massive transparent sphere, representing the moment of the creation of the world. This part of the work is executed in grisaille, that is, with a restrained monochromatic color. Apparently, this is done to achieve a special effect, when the panels open, and the monochrome image gives way to a spectacle of incredible colors. It enhances the explosive effect on the viewer. Even now, the open triptych impresses with its vividness, compositional solution, and abundance of figures and details. Back then, 500 years ago, people had never seen anything like it, and this work simply blew minds. In the open position, the left panel represents paradise or Eden, the central panel, the garden of earthly delights, and the right panel, hell. This work, populated with fantastical creatures, grotesque monsters, and beautiful people, combines a multitude of different symbols and allegories, both Christian, alchemical, and erotic. It is a bold intrusion into the subconscious, the dreamlike world that the artist tried to express in his work. The left panel depicts the last three days of the creation of the world, God created luminaries, plants, land animals, and men in his own image. 
In the foreground is a scene where God the Creator holds Eve by the hand, resembling a marriage ceremony. Adam gazes admirably at the beautiful Eve, his cheeks blushing. Eve modestly casts her eyes down. In the center of the panel is the Fountain of Life, a whimsical pink fountain in the blue waters of the river, at the base of which pearls and precious stones are scattered. Inside, we see an owl, at that time symbolizing darkness, spiritual blindness, and heresy. Overall, the owl is one of Bosch's favorite symbols and is often depicted in his paintings. Various peaceful birds and animals inhabit the landscape, including even a unicorn. However, not everything is idyllic in this world. Sinister three-headed lizards crawl out of the lake, and huge black amphibians, probably a symbol that vices are already inherent in human nature from the beginning. By the way, pay attention to the face formed by the folds of the landscape and the crawling creatures. Salvador Dali was clearly inspired by this image when creating his The Great Masturbator. Salvador Dali closely studied Bosch's work and was strongly influenced by his painting technique and created images. In the background, various animals graze, drink from watering holes, and birds gather in flocks. It should be noted that elephants and giraffes were considered novelties in the 16th century since Africa was virtually unexplored at that time, and Bosch could only get an idea of these animals through scientific treatises. For example, Bosch might have observed the depiction of a giraffe in the colorful albums of the Italian traveler Syriac of Ancona. Let's move to the central part of the triptych. Here, we see a fantastical garden where naked men and women indulge in the pleasures of life, playing, bathing, dancing, feasting on fruits and giant berries. In those times, depicting naked bodies had nothing sinful about it. It is important to remember that, for medieval people, the body did not carry sexual connotations. Naked people appear both in paradise and in hell since everyone stands before God without disguise, wigs, and social status. They are precisely what they are in reality, as created by nature and God. The composition is a complex intellectual rebus, a dreamlike flow of sexual images with numerous encrypted symbols and objects inspired by old Dutch songs, proverbs, and colloquial expressions. It is an intellectual dream about sensual pleasures, a world before the flood and the fall. In the depiction of Voluptuous of Fruits, some researchers saw an allegory of debauchery and carnal pleasures. The outdated meaning of the Dutch word Vogel, bird, sexual intercourse. Therefore, the depiction of large birds is Bosch's allegory of people's unrestraint in lust and debauchery. Similarly, another expression, harvesting fruits, for example, also contains an erotic subtext and denotes copulation. Hollow fruits with characters inside and the peel are associated with the Dutch pun, shell shill, meaning both peel and conflict. However, there are various other interpretations, suggesting that berries represent specific symbols, the sweetness of cherries symbolizes the softness and kindness of a person, blackberry symbolizes the purity of the Virgin Mary, and strawberry is a sign of righteousness and diligence. Which interpretation is closer to the truth? Most likely, we will never know. In the background, we see five whimsical structures, one of which is a fountain, possibly the fountain of eternal youth, consisting of various elements adorned with huge flowers, fruits, and gemstones. The other four are castles of vanity, filled with acrobats, birds, and exotic plants. People bathe in the fountain waters, mermaids, and creatures in armor swim. In the sky, people are also visible, some hover on their own wings, someone flies on a griffin or a flying fish. In a small lake, several groups of young blonde girls are present, around them. Riders on various exotic animals dance in a circle, some in quite whimsical poses, someone holds a huge fish, someone feeds birds with berries. What is this? The zodiac. The cycle of rebirth. We can only guess. Some have crows on their heads, others wear white spoonbills, and large red fruits rest on the heads of the third group. Mythological creatures are also present, unicorns, griffins, migrated from the left panel. Giving a definitive interpretation of what Bosch really wanted to convey is quite challenging. Currently, there are several hypotheses interpreting the images of the triptych. One interpretation is that men, not yet expelled from paradise, for whom everything grows, who has everything ready to serve him, has no worries, and faces no punishments, what else is there for him to do? He multiplies. He is beautiful, natural, far from the world of shame. Therefore, there is no jealousy in this paradise, no hatred, here, a celebration of senses takes place. The painting is a kind of sentence on boundless lust. According to another version, 
The central part of the triptych represents the world before the universal flood. Lust and greed indicate the real state of affairs on Earth, which prompted God to destroy the world. Hell is other people, said Jean-Paul Sartre. On the right panel, we witness the depiction of hell, or, as it is also called, the musical hell. Generally, the theme of the Last Judgment is one of the most important and impressive in the history of medieval European art, and Bosch continued this tradition. The composition is irrational, built with a deliberate violation of the laws of perspective. Houses in the background burn brightly in the flames of the underworld against a menacingly black sky. The brown river of fire and blood carries sinners into the very heart of hell. In the lower left corner, sinners are punished for their passion for gambling, subjecting them to horrific tortures. Dogs torment one of the envious sinners, a demon impales the heart of a sinner on a sword, and a giant rabbit drags its victim, bleeding. A hand pierced by a dagger is a punishment for wrath or theft. A severed thief's hand was highly valued among those who practiced black magic. Note how this hand resembles the hand from the left panel. Iron armor could symbolize medieval torture, for example, the iron helmet was screwed onto the head, breaking the bones of the skull, and the iron boots clamped the legs, the degree of compression depended on the severity of the sentence. People wearing such boots were supposed to walk around the city, announcing their approach with an iron bell. Slightly above, among giant musical instruments, a hellish concert is taking place. One sinner is crucified on a harp, pierced by its strings, a lute becomes a torture device for another, and with its lower part, it presses down a third whose buttocks bear the imprints of the melody's notes. Enthusiasts have tried to decipher and record the notes, and now you can hear this hellish melody. Opposite that musicians, on the right side of the composition is the punishment for gluttony. A monstrous bird with a cauldron instead of a hat and paws stuck into two jugs devours sinners and digests people, throwing them into a cesspool. This monster is often identified as Satan. However, there is an interesting theory according to which it is Cronus, or Saturn, merciless time devouring its children. In the astrological books of that time, the sign of Aquarius was placed under Saturn's feet in the form of a jug. And on the feet of Bosch's monster, we see two jugs. The glutton is vomiting, and the greedy one is excreting golden coins. A woman sitting under Satan's mantle embraces a black creature with a toad on her chest. In front of her, a creature with a convex mirror instead of buttocks, reflecting the face of the victim. Apparently, the woman symbolizes the sin of pride or narcissism. Bosch made her very similar to Eve from the first painting, perhaps this is Eve, and all this is payment for the original sin, who knows. The key place in the composition belongs to the image of the treeman, whose body is an empty shell, and legs are withered stumps standing in hollow swaying boats. Inside the treeman, something resembling a tavern is happening, where new visitors climb the stairs. There is a suggestion that the treeman represents the self-portrait of the artist. On his head lies a round tabletop, and a violin stands, around which dancing imps lead sinners. The violin and the round shape symbolize female and male sexual symbols, just like the composition consisting of a knife between two ears, which, like a tank, advances on a crowd of sinners, undermining them and cutting them with its giant blade. On the blade, there is a stamp, the letter M. Most likely, it is the initial letter of the word, Mundus, world. Arrows, often found in Bosch's compositions, symbolize evil, sometimes it protrudes across the hat, sometimes pierces bodies, sometimes even stuck into the anus of a half-naked person, which also hints at corruption and lack of chastity. The latter is a symbol of the path to knowledge in alchemy or sexual intercourse. The inverted funnel is an attribute of fraud or false wisdom. In Bosch's hell, chaos reigns, a terrifying carnival where all logical connections are overturned. The most ordinary objects acquire immense sizes and turn into horrifying torture instruments. Bosch's creative legacy has no analogues in world art. The language of his metaphors is mysterious. In the 20th century, surrealists called him the honorary professor of nightmares. Hieronymus Bosch is the last jewel of Gothic painting, the creator of an era in which heightened religiosity, the magic of the mind, and reckless reality converged. But I've rambled on enough. Inspired by the great Bosch, let's get down to work. We'll be painting the picture with oil on canvas. 
We start with underpainting, filling the main areas with a key color to establish SH correct tonal relationships. Generally, Bosch's technique is mostly a la prima, meaning the impasto method of oil painting, where thickly applied initial strokes create the final texture. However, this technique makes sense when using sufficiently large canvases. I'll remind you, the triptych size is 220 by 389 centimeters. If the detailing is high and the canvas is small, it makes sense to work with glazes or sfumato, applying paint in very thin layers and blending it so that brush strokes are not visible. Initially, I plan to make only a sketch for a future large painting, using a very small canvas size of 30 by 40 centimeters. However, as I progressed, I got carried away and decided to draw everything in more detail. The color and tonal decisions are taken from the hell panel, dark, ominous, saturated with reddish, black, and greenish steel shades. Among the pigments used by Bosch, one can identify red and yellow ochre, cadmium red, copper green, carbon black, earth tones, and lead white. I chose the manticore for the depiction because this creature closely echoes Bosch's symbolism and visually resembles the biblical locust. The canonical text, Apocalypse, Chapter 9, describes this creature, the locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. On their heads, they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had tails with stingers, like scorpions. The manticore is also depicted with the body and mane of a lion, the tail of a scorpion, sometimes with the face of a human, and in some cases, even with wings, so the choice is entirely justified. In addition to the manticore, it will be necessary to densely fill the space with various strange creatures. This is a favorite practice of the artist. As I worked, I changed the composition several times, rewrote some details, and searched for the right tonality because only in the process does the correct composition and arrangement of elements become apparent. Of course, it is pointless and impossible to perfectly replicate the style and detail of a master of such caliber. It may take months for such work. I'm just trying to work in the same relaxed surrealism, allowing myself some liberties and consciously breaking some rules. Some say that Bosch's insane imagination is a result of ergotism, a fungus that parasitizes on rye. This raging disease was worse than the plague in Bosch's time. The action of the ergot alkaloids on people was depressing. A person who ate bread contaminated with the fungus experienced unbearable skin burning. Then, their skin would be covered with ulcers, turning black due to disrupted blood circulation. If gangrene set in, limbs were amputated. The nervous system was also affected, resulting in hallucinations and uncontrollable convulsions. In the Middle Ages, this disease was called ST, Anthony's Fire, or Witch's Cramps. However, as a practicing artist, I doubt this version, Bosch's hand was steady enough, and on his canvases, it's challenging to find traces of the disease, such as uncertain or meaningless strokes made by convulsing hands. Moreover, the scale of Bosch's works, the amount of work, intelligence, and irony, rather indicate that he was mentally healthy. To me, he seems like a smart person, obsessed with his work, with a good sense of humor and self-irony. As a token of appreciation for the most dedicated viewers, I'll leave a symbolic gift, in the description, you'll find a link where you can download some of Bosch's creatures, cut out, with a transparent layer, for free. You can use them for virtual cards, emojis, memes, or simply share them with a friend.